The modern commercial fisheries of Alaska are the best managed, most sustainable in the world. But it was not always that way. The conservation ethic that created them was no accident and did not come easily. For nearly a century, Alaska natives, fishermen, pioneers, and communities battled against absentee federal bureaucrats who allowed a rapacious outside canning industry to not only decimate salmon runs, but nearly wipe out the very industry that was the lifeblood of Alaska as well. This is the inspiring story of people and communities working together to resurrect a natural resource from disaster. One hundred and fifty years ago, the celebrated evolutionary biologist Thomas Huxley proclaimed the Earth's oceans were inexhaustible, would provide humankind with an unlimited supply of food forever. In the span of a single human lifetime, that assertion would prove to be tragically wrong. Just twenty years after the first cannery was built in Alaska in 1878, Canned salmon had become the economic backbone of the fledgling Alaska Territory, and the towns and cities of the Pacific Coast were booming with cash as well. As with most booms, nobody wanted to admit that it couldn't go on forever. Not even 50 years later, President Dwight D. Eisenhower declared the salmon runs of Alaska a national disaster. From their peak before World War II of 120 million fish returning to Alaska watersheds, the runs had collapsed to barely 25 million fish. Some runs were in danger of disappearing forever. They were just literally wiping it out. There were fish streams, they'd put a chicken wire fence across. If there wasn't a flood or something, why? The fish just couldn't get up. It didn't make any difference how much you got up the stream or how good your area management biologist was. He'd get overridden in a heartbeat by the canned salmon industry in Washington, D.C. Nobody cared. Absentee ownership and absentee government just was destroying everything. After a century of error and irresponsibility by federal overseers, a few inspired politicians, fishermen, and fisheries managers embarked on what would become a decades-long quest to return the runs to their former abundance. Andy Anderson, Alaska's first commissioner of Fish and Game, had been in charge of the territorial fisheries, but he had no real control over the management decisions made by the federal government. He was saying, the wealth of your nation it comes from the sea and the soil and the land. It isn't made out of paper. You know, if you don't protect the living resources and watch how you log, watch everything, you're going to have nothing left. And uh, Egan, when the, we had the Constitutional Convention, Egan took him with him, and it was uh, Clarence Anderson that put in the sustained yield part of the Constitution. In what proved to be a monumental change in public policy of natural resources, the framers of Alaska's Constitution crafted a unique clause that requires Alaska's resources be managed as a sustainable public trust. With statehood, the salmon now belong to the people of the state of Alaska, not the fishermen and not the commercial canning industry. And Alaskans were willing to make great sacrifices to protect them. The one I like is Clarence calling his six management biologists together 
Gentlemen, the governor has instructed me to return Alaska salmon run to their former abundance, regardless of the pain inflicted on the people. Though Anderson and his biologists were up against an almost impossible challenge, they managed to fundamentally change the terms of the relationship between Alaska salmon and the people who controlled the harvest. They separated those who protect the resource from those who allocate it. During the next three decades, Alaskans suffered through fishing restrictions that stretched the personal resources of coastal people to the breaking point. Depleted runs meant closures that were brutal to fishermen who had boat payments to make and families to feed. Then in the early 1970s, Alaskans took the unprecedented step of limiting access to the fishing grounds, enduring bitter conflicts over who was entitled to fish and who wasn't. You gotta remember that the biologists lived in those towns too. They they went to church. They were on the you know, school boards with with the same fishermen, with the same uh, people from the plants and whatnot. So there was truly Alaska and you know Petersburg and Seward and Cordova and you know these towns. There was a you know everybody's motivation was the same. Nobody wanted to not have a, a lot of fish. Now if you're a biologist and it was a poor return and it wasn't a lot of fishing time, you know wasn't as good a life for you as, as it was when there's lots of fish. If you're a processor and the price of fish is low that year, it's not as fun as if it's high. Uh, but at the end of the day, all that stuff was just secondary to the fact that, you know, are we managing this fishery for the right reasons? And the state has proven for many years they have been. There is much more to the story of Alaska's fisheries miracle and how the ethic of conservation in Alaska fisheries was implemented. Legislators defied the timber industry and other special interest groups in favor of the resurrection of the salmon runs, passing laws that protected streams and rivers that are just as essential to the salmon's survival as the ocean. In one of the most unique contributions to the resurrection of Alaska salmon runs, fishermen voted to tax themselves to build a massive system of hatcheries and watershed restoration programs. Finally, the salmon started to come back. Today, Alaska's salmon runs exceed those of even the boom years before World War II. The runs still endure cyclical downturns, and there are allocation disputes about who can catch how many fish. But the commitment to conservation and sustainability that rebuilt the salmon runs still govern them. And even more consequentially, those values migrated from salmon management to the cod, pollock, crab, and other offshore fisheries. Not once have the federal managers voted to allocate fish against the scientific recommendations for sustainability. Making the modern commercial fisheries of Alaska the best managed, most sustainable in the world. Please join us in celebrating this inspiring story of how the conservation ethic can transform humanity's relationship with the world's oceans. Hi, I'm Dr. Brock Bernstein, President of the National Fisheries Conservation Center. The commercial fisheries of Alaska are the most sustainable in the world, an example of how people and communities working together can rescue a resource from disaster. The story of that miracle is priceless at a time when the food supply from the Earth's oceans is more threatened than ever before. With your help, we can share a great fisheries success story with others for whom the Alaska miracle will provide both inspiration and leadership. The Alaska Fisheries Archive is a repository for recorded audio and video interviews, documents, and digital files chronicling the lives and work of fishermen, scientists, leaders, and many others who inspired the conservation ethic that saved the fisheries of the North Pacific. The personal accounts of the many men and women who helped shape this remarkable story will provide a permanent, useful resource for historians, journalists, 
biologists, fisheries managers, and anyone else involved in making decisions about fisheries. From these interviews and other research, we will create a 30-minute video, The Alaska Fisheries Miracle, that will be offered at no cost to museums, teachers, broadcasters, and online to provide context for the archive.